Thank you very much. Right, um, we have on the agenda, first item, declarations of interest. Are there any, please, Councillor Smith? Uh, Non-disclosable interest in item 14. Councillor Profit. And I'd like to declare an interest in item 9. I'm related to the applicant and will re um, remove myself from the chamber. Councillor Francis. And non Are there any more? Thank you. Uh, item two, minutes of the previous meeting. It is one to 12 in your pack. Are there any points of accuracy, Councillor Gothic? Uh, yes, Chairman, thank you. At the top of page 11, we seem to have got an incomplete sentence or a couple of sentences where the senior manager strategic development is actually obviously saying something that is not reported. Yeah, it's the, the, the it's a half a sentence that says she said that she would. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you do you know what you're gonna? Yeah. Right. We are going to take those minutes with that half sentence deleted. John, uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, page five, just a question really on action item six, which uh, was meant to come to full council in March, but isn't on today's agenda. Sorry, can you, I, I missed what you said uh, there. Page five, resolved point six. Yeah. Plan savings was meant to, uh, uh, a risk assessment was meant to come to full council in March. I don't think that's on the agenda. Right. Yeah. Can we have that next month then, please? Sorry, I... Can we have the um, risk assessment for the plan savings that we agreed in February that we were going to have in this meeting? Can we have that next month, please? Um, I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Is that... Yeah, I'm sorry. That's okay. Fine. Are there any more... Points on the on the previous minutes. In that case, I have a proposal that they are an accurate record. Councillor Francis, seconded by Councillor Marcus. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, right, um, Chairman's announcements. Um, there's, there's a couple of small ones, well, significantly small ones, but uh, I'd like to ask Councillor Davis, if he would, to uh, update us on uh, a piece of good news, if you wouldn't mind, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm sure most of us know by now that Park House, actually, they went to the award ceremony a week or two back and actually won, having been selected uh, as a finalist, they've actually won. So I thought I'd bring along today the award because I don't suppose you've all been into Park House but it's a rather magnificent piece of sorry I didn't break it. Oh, I you didn't break it no well I've got it caref I've got it carefully wrapped up it's fairly solid but it's it's too nice to damage obviously I'll read it it says Cornwall and Isles of Silly Care and Support Awards 2018 out Outstanding residential or nursing home care team of the year, team of the year, winner, Park House. I'll leave it out for people to look at uh, on the way out at the end of the meeting. I think, obviously, we must congratulate the team. We're extremely lucky to be um, have them on the islands and, and working so well together. We, we those who been associated with Park House, have known for, for a long, long time what a magnificent um, job they have done for this community. Park House had actually started way back when I first came, just started. The flats had not been built, um, but uh, were, were obviously added on slightly later. Over the years, we've had, and I would like to pay tribute to also take this opportunity to those manageresses uh, who have gone before and all those who've worked in Park House. 
They have served our community magnificently, and it's something we should treasure and remember and respect. All the talk recently about ACS, ICS, SOF, and all the rest of it has been going on for more than two years. What really concerns me is that whatever happens at the end of the day, and I went to the very the first public meeting here and said in this room, I, I'm a maverick here, and I still feel a bit of a maverick. We have got to we have got to conserve, we have got to retain the governance of Park House, as far as I'm concerned, so that we can continue this magnificent tradition. I have seen several things go to the mainland, including the primary care services. I'm sorry, but those who run it, who live on the mainland, in, with the best winner in the world, cannot see things from our perspective. Those that have worked in Park House over the years have not failed us and they've not failed us, and they've been selected, and they've been, they've learned on the job, or they've been trained, or they've come with training. Uh, the experience of our present manager is, is actually exceptional at the time she's spent on the mainland. We have got to preserve this. Whatever comes out of all this reorganization, whether it becomes part co-located or whatever, we have got to retain the governments of this team, because this actually shows that the mainland recognizes what goes on here, and I'm sure we do too. So just a, a, big th a big thank you to all who are there now and all who've preceded them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. I'd, I'd like to add my personal uh, congratulations as well to the team that's involved. We have come uh, in the last 12 months in particular an awful long way from where we were. I have been in personally to Park House and congratulated them, and I know uh, the Vice Chair has as well. Um, but I'd just like it put on record uh, that we support them 100%. Uh, thank you. Uh, another announcement, a very quick verbal update from um, Vice Chair. Yeah. Yes, um, I'm quite happy to have given the verbal update under members' updates, but perfectly happy to say now that the reason that I haven't done a written report on finance is that obviously we've got finance issues on this meeting, but I'd just like to flag that I've been recently to a local enterprise partnership meeting where we have had significant reports, including this document, which I'm happy to share later, on 10 opportunities, one of which is the opportunity for tourism to be enhanced and its importance emphasised, which is really good. And I've also attended the Business Week, which Island Partnership um, supported and had a very interesting presentation from a member of the staff of the uh, Bank of England, which was really interesting. And the recent Destination Management Plan afternoon, which was also attended by um, our manager, Nicholas Stinson, and also um, the director of place, and I'm sure supported by all of us, um, moved forward a destination management plan, which was really well received, which is very so vital for the economic um, viability of these islands. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Um, item four, question understanding order 14. I have not any. Um, we haven't got any... Uh, uh, under item five, either minutes or draft minutes. Uh, we have no motions under standing order 12. Um, member updates uh, from lead members are coming on in later, and I have no urgent items. Um, item nine, uh, planning application. Um, Lisa, can I pass over to you, please? Yep, thank you, Chair. Can you um, hang on a second, Lisa? Uh, yes. Just for Fran to leave. Sorry. Uh, this is um, a report for the assessment of an application to change the use of a small piece of land from ancillary boat hire in connection with Bennett Boatyard on Briar. The small piece of land sits at the top of the foreshore between the access road that leads to the boatyard and the beach. No physical alterations or boundaries are proposed <coughs> to be erected on the land, but it will be used for the daily positioning of a mobile building for the purposes of boat hire. You'll note from the report that the application has been amended due to concerns expressed about the scale of the proposed building, um, and the ability for it to be moved daily as specified in the application. 
However, a mobile structure, particularly one that's moved daily, does not require planning permission. The applicant took the details of this building out of the application. And on this basis, the material change of use only for ancillary boat hire was considered to be acceptable. There is a condition that would kick in that would enable the council to approve the details of the mobile structure should it be required to be positioned on site for a prolonged period on the basis of this assessment and for the subject to the conditions it's recommended for approval. Any questions? Councillor Marcus. Yeah, I, um, I will go with the recommendation. I think the mitigation of any long-term impacts are, uh, as Lisa stated, uh, explained in condition three on page 22 about the uh, removal and the movement of the item um, and it's also worth noting that there are no local representations in the reports and the office hasn't received any local representation so therefore I approve the recommendation. So is that a proposal? Uh, I would second that proposal. Secondly, are there any further questions? And that goes straight to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, could you uh, ask Councillor Grotick to return, please? And not Matt, 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 hang on. We're doing, we're doing the ICS first. Oh, it's okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Matt, screen forward a little bit so we can actually see the people. Okay. All right. At this at this juncture, uh, I am going to move uh, number item number nineteen to the next item on the agenda about the um, integrated strategic. Commission, because we have with us uh, Ellen Childs, who has to catch a flight um, uh, earlier than we thought because of potential weather problems. So, to actually get Ellen back home, I'm moving this one forward. Uh, would you like to uh, kick off? Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Helen Charles. I'm the Chief Operating Officer working for NHS Kerno um, and here to help support the conversation and debate about the Integrated Strategic Commissioning Proposals. Uh, would you like to say a few words? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so <clears throat> Um, the report in front of you, I take as read, it's a fairly extensive report with a lot of background information. I think what is important um, for members to recognize is that this item, this topic, deals with the strategic commissioning, not with the provision, um, which is, um, is, is taking place at, at another point in time. Um, the report in front of you sets out um, a bit of the background um, of the um, STP, the um, tr transition plans that have been worked on for the last two years, um, and the proposal to uh, develop a kind of a shadow arrangement, how we can be better in um, commissioning and articulating the um, outcomes, if you like, that need to be uh, delivered for our community and the wider community in Cornwall. Um, as I said, the read the paper as read. The proposal um, uh, that has been developed by officers and, and the various boards is um, a number of options have been uh, reviewed and the proposal is to uh, now move to the development of an outline business case setting out what that means and start to uh, work in a shadow form uh, jointly together with um, the key strategic commissioning partners. Key strategic pa commissioning partners being Council of the Arts of Scilly, Cornwall Council and the um, uh, CCG uh, commissioning group, Kerno commissioning group. Are there any questions that members want to ask Helen because she has been very much um, the centre of the development of the proposals? and we'll provide, be able to provide some further details. 
I'd like to start off the, this debate then in that case. Um, if we go to uh, the, the outline business case, what we've got in this report at the moment, and I have just mentioned this to you, is a proposal business case. It's not a full business case, and we cannot accept that as a full business case, and there's no way that we can. Um, would you like to just expand on that a little bit, please, Helen? Um, you're absolutely right. This is a proposal, um, and I think other partners, so I've had conversations with the CCG governing body. Um, I was at a member's briefing at Cornwall Council yesterday morning, um, and NHS England have also debated the proposal. I think it's fair to say that this is the start of a journey. Um, we are looking to develop a full business case by September at the very earliest. And this proposal asks each of the commissioning organisations in Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly to recommend to take the first step towards us considering how we can commission together better. So it doesn't change any of the statutory responsibilities of each of the organisations. Um, it doesn't change the governance arrangements of the different organisations. Um, and it doesn't change any of the delegation. Um, but what it does do, it outlines, I hope, the, the, the desire for us to work better together to commission services for health and care in a different way with some potential proposals. And they're the options that are outlined as to how that could in the future be reconfigured from the option of doing nothing, which all the other organisations have said actually isn't an option because we can do better collectively together to option six which is looking at the, the proposal to delegate to a subcommittee of potentially the health and well-being boards delegate authority but there's in no way this proposal um, enables us to take that um, to that final stage until we have gone through what we're calling gateways where people will say and you I think you've outlined your principles in here, things that you would want to see in place before you would even consider any delegation, um, that we would work through those gateways to assure ourselves um, as each individual partners that we were in the right place to do this, to do this work. Um, and I think what's really important for you in the Isles of Scilly is that you are one of four equal partners in this process. And so um, whatever you agree to do, your voice will be as equal as the other three partners as commissioners. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for that explanation. Uh, I would just say that this is a very de weighty and detailed document, and we have had particular issues around IT and the because of that, we have had difficulty in receiving this report, and most of us have only actually had a couple of since um, either just before the weekend or just after to actually give it our detailed consideration. I know we all want to work together, and I know we support the concept of greater health and social care integration. We do. However, I think it is generally felt from speaking to colleagues and an interest in the field that we would support some greater clarity into the practical ramifications of this. I fully understand, as you have said, that there are protections as we move forward. But we would like, I think, we would be really um, grateful for a clearer explanation of the positive outcomes that we hope to achieve for the people that put us in our seats. I try to make it a rule that I never vote for anything that I can't explain to someone who might have voted for me and put me in my seat. I'll be perfectly frank. These recommendations as they currently sit, I would have difficulty in explaining exactly what they meant to a member of our community. And so later on when we've had a round the table discussion, I would like to approve the direction of travel as you say but slightly soften the recommendations to ask for greater democratic input into the process going forward. We've had weather delays. We've had the fact that we were going to have another scrutiny committee meeting to look at the outline business case put on the back burner because I believe the papers weren't ready. 
so that for many councillors, this will be the first time they've actually looked in any detail at all at what is going to be a significant change for the people who live in our community. And I am very anxious that we protect, as I'm sure you are, the outcomes for the people that we serve. So without being negative, I am looking to change these recommendations and soften them slightly. And I hope that later on, um, I'll be able to put them to colleagues and we'll see if they would hopefully be agreeable to you and still keep the direction of travel going while giving us greater protection and hopefully a bit more democratic input as we move forward. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, I agree with much of what um, Councillor Grothick said. From a personal point of view, the sort of areas I'd just like some clarification on are the workings of a joint committee and how silly would be um, a key player in that process. Um, a summary of the opportunity and threats that going forward with option six stroke option two um, generate for us. So that's op opportunities and threats both for us as commissioners and as a community. And also um, a bit more clarity on the roles of the two health and wellbeing boards, um, Cornwalls and Sillies, in terms of um, working together, potential delegation and the role within the joint committee. Do you, want, do you want to answer that now, or, or and I'll come back to you, Councillor Leg. I'll come to you in a moment. Okay. I'll, I'll try and take each of those questions in turn and, and uh, check check in whether I've answered them in the way that's helpful. Um, there is a, there is a proposal um, in in relation to option six to to create a joint committee between the four organisations. Um, there is the potential for us to look at a subcommittee of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, I believe that the LGA are working with us to understand whether that wh whether that's actually possibly possible to, because Health and Wellbeing Boards are statutes for for each for both Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. So what we would aspire to is something that would be an absolute joint committee where as i've said before all partners would be equal around the table we haven't described what the terms of reference could look like um, there is an aspiration in the future to think about how uh, authority could be delegated to that committee but that couldn't be done without agreement of all of those statutory organizations so we're a long way from being able to describe that in any detail. Um, I think where we would like to start is where we would start to have um, equal representation of officers, where we could start to then think about the kinds of things that we could do differently and then come back to think about a delegated authority. Um, you asked about opportunities and threats. Um, I would like to think that because we're using the, the notion of the gateways to move through towards um, option six, potentially, that we would mitigate against any threats. Because the whole purpose of doing this is actually to see what opportunities we can gain from commissioning together. So I would be wanting to see that through the gateways that we'd be really clear about if there were concerns about the outcomes for the public, that those would be part of the gateway process. So if you felt that um, there was particular issues that were pertinent to the islands, then you would actually put that within the gateway <coughs> criteria and say, we would not progress any further or we would stop doing it if we felt that there was a threat to a particular issue that was pertinent to the island. Um, in terms of opportunities, I, I, I genuinely believe that we can do more together better as, as four commissioners working on health and care than we currently do. Um, and what I, I said, and I think it's mentioned in the, the papers here, that I, a personal commitment for myself as a strategic commissioner to help support the um, Isles of Scilly more than perhaps has been happened before. I know that you've got a good relationship with Andrew Abbott as one of the locality leads, but I think that in my new role supporting um, strategic commissioning Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, that actually there's an opportunity to do, for us to do far better commissioning together. And I think that's possibly the, the greatest opportunity that we have. I don't know whether that 
No, I totally accept that. Um, I hate the phrase we're on a journey, but we are. Um, and, and the time scales are, are tight in some aspects. Um, and it, it, it's a very evolving document, isn't it? It's a very evolving project, so um, it's all very subject to change. Just in terms of time scales, um, I think everyone, or each of the organisations has recognised we will go as fast as we can, but as slowly as we need to. Because um, what I, I think we're at risk if we were not to put indicative time scales in, we possibly wouldn't work at the pace that we needed to. But if, if it is that we need to take more time, then we can do that. If I, it, 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 my, my, my biggest concern, if we talk about risk or threat, is purely our, our capacity as a local authority to be fully engaged in the process. I'd imagine there are meetings going on almost on a daily basis. And I think the Chief Executive alluded to this previously. It's just we don't, I don't believe, have the... Uh, capacity of the people on the ground to actually be there at every different level. So it's just um, making sure we're there where it really, really matters. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 138, uh, page 10 of the uh, appendix, um, paragraph 7.2, uh, bullet point 2, uh, Council of the Isles of Scilly will need a system control total and be assured uh, and performance managed. Um, what does a system control total mean? Um, it's, a, it's a financial term. So it, it, all it means is that we have a financial envelope we have to work to, um, both within the NHS and within council services. And so a system control total is a financial control total. Um, for, this, for the Cornwall and the House of Scilly. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, that last point, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Helen Childs because what she said first has um, made things a little easier for me to understand, though I do share Councillor Gothic's um, reservations about the understanding the wording. I am um, slightly difficult position going back about history, but we have to learn by history. And this whole uh, discussion about re reorganization has been going on for, I believe, more than two years and a great deal of time and money is being spent. But I think sometimes we actually lose sight of, of what, what we could be doing. And we are, in effect, turning or trying to turn the clock back. Page 130 at the top, the first bullet point says, put the person first and not the organization. The other day I came back from the, from the mainland <clears throat> and witnessed the failure of our present system, abject failure, I must say, of the present system as to how the person, the individual is dealt with. I've already alluded to what's good, but it's the cure that's egg. There's certain areas where we've already seen that we excel, but unfortunately, the, the, the distribution between the uh, commissioners and the providers across several bodies has resulted in, in chaos in some, some occasions, and the individual is the one who suffers. When I came, as I said, going back historically, we, I, I joined the practice here when we were actually commissioned by the local authority. We, we answered as primary care to the local authority, and we were, in effect, the providers. And as I say, I'm in a slightly difficult position. I, I came here because it, it was even better than where I was in an isolated practice in rural Norfolk, where we had, when we could do far more for our patients. Mm -hmm. Uh, than the average GP on the mainland even in those days. And this was the attraction, and a lot of that has been lost. But as I say, I, I, what concerns me is that we're, we're, we're moving very slowly, but we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the, that the patient, the individual, must come first. And uh, that, that, that's my main concern. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you.
Councillor Marcus. I might have missed something, and excuse me if I have, but in terms of the gateway checks, who is actually checking, doing the checking and approving the checking? Because the, uh, the uh, recommendations are kind of alluding that we're agreeing to gateway check two by process, by this process anyway. So, yeah, how are they getting approved? I'm not sure it's... You're not missing anything in that context, um, and it, it is quite. It is a very complex document, and I appreciate that. In um, Appendix Three, so page one fifty twenty-two, there's the diagrams, um, and um, what this is trying to demonstrate are the, the, the three phases in terms of the time scales that are being uh, indicated. And if you take the first three, the first block, agreeing the start of mobilization phase, that's where we are now. Um, and what, um, what we're asking is for the beginning of April for us to start to work and using our colleagues' notion of we're on the journey, to start the journey, we would be asking through this process and this proposal to to go through gateway check one, um, and that is to assess the, these proposals in this document to approve the approach in principle, um, and that we would agree and be a further, much more detailed business case that would be available by September at the earliest. So this is the first check. And what it says in that bottom start mobilization phase, what would be different during this phase would be that there would be a system lead chief executive officer appointed to oversee strategic commissioning, that we would develop a cross organizational officer group that would be uh, between ourselves, uh, the Isles of Scilly Council, Cornwall Council and NHS England and that we would start to be working virtually in that new way of working. And that is the first phase for mobilization. More than that, until we had then developed the work plan and agreed the key task, which is in the next phase down, moving from mobilization to design. Um, and we would then come back to you to go through the next gateway check. Um, once we had got to that point and again then following through from design to refine so they're, they're the gateway check so what we're asking through this proposal and acknowledging colleagues may wish to change the recommendations but what we would be looking for as part of this conversation and, and, and um, support would be for that gateway check one does that does that help answer your question <coughs> Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's just proposal recommendation number three, I think, is just a bit vague. Um, if you look at page 121, sorry. And, uh, yeah, that's... So, so just, just to summarise from what you, you were asking there, from what you just said, we are the gateway check as opposed to... Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, as opposed to any other body uh, externally to us, I, I, I only just want to emphasise that for clarity. Yeah. Councillor Marcus, uh, yeah, you're fine. Right. Uh, more comments, Councillor Graffy. Um, I accept that, and that's very um, that's very reassuring. However, what I would like to see, with absolutely no respect, disrespect to anyone involved in the process, is that we would like to actually see that, if you like, enshrined in a protocol. Um, I find some of these recommendations a bit overarching. They sort of seem to suggest that we start the train, and give me, but very often trains in these processes start going along and it is incredibly difficult to stop them once they've started. So it's better to be sure that you're absolutely sure that you support what it is you're joining in with at the very outset. And I still would like some greater clarity on, for example, and I know the chairman shares this view, on, for example, the local accountability, the local democratic input and issues around um, governance of, for example, our care home. 
Does that make sense? Um, I, th I think what Casper says is that from the outset of this process, uh, we have expressed very strongly uh, our uh, desire to maintain a control over the destiny of what we deliver now on the islands. Red lines, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I think what Council Gotti is alluding to is that is there a possibility that via this process that that will uh, be diluted? No, that, that, that's, that's the question. Yeah, that's fine. It's just forgive me if I'm wrong and forgive me if I haven't had enough time, although I have studied it obviously for a, a good watch a good long time but nevertheless there doesn't seem to me any actual insurance here of in, in fact we really haven't had the time to properly articulate what our red lines exactly are given that the scrutiny committee was scant uh, was um, cancelled that was actually going to have a closer look at option six and that in the interim we had a presentation a very useful presentation um, from um, Jackie Pendleton via video conferencing because of the weather constraints and obviously weather constraints meant that not all members could attend that so therefore there has been in my humble opinion a lack of democratic input into the process to date and that is not helping us understand how what we're actually agreeing to will move forward regardless of the fact that you're giving us very careful assurances and I accept your, your good intent as I accept the good intent of every other partner in this and we do want to work together we, we're not trying to be negative we just want to be sure that we know what we're actually signing up for. Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Surely page 137 answers uh, Councillor Grotty's concerns and your concerns, Ted. There's going to be a joint committee of which we are one quarter. We are only a village at the end of the day, but we have a, a large say in the, in, the meeting, in the joint committee when it meets. It's up to us to shout for the individual, as I was saying earlier, at that joint committee. Yep, sorry. Is, is that not where we get represented in all this? Yep. Well, then, I think we're very lucky that we have a, so much of a say, quite honestly. Because if I'm there, I should be shouting. <laughs> <laughs> and we yes. hope you, you hope you will, but we've had so many weather constraints, we actually haven't managed to date to be as engaged. Perhaps I'm looking for some sort of formal recognition that um, our, our vote and presence will be engaged. If we can't get there physically, then we have to certainly be sure we can get there in a, you know, courtesy of video conferencing or something we cannot we cannot alter the weather but i would just point out that the weather forecasting is a lot more accurate than it was 40 years ago when i came to these islands it is possible to make sure that we have representation there i was the only member any person from silly at the first meeting of the leadership forum a week or two back um, you know that was the first the first meeting but i felt it was a pivotal meeting because in the council chamber at uh, uh, New New County Hall, there were all the main the main actors, if you like, not in the literal sense, the people with power in Cornwall, and that was the only representation we had. But I went over there early to make sure I was there, and I think this is what we've got to do. We may be an island, but we've got to look at things as they are. We can't, you know, we can't go on bleating about not not being able to get there. We've just got to jolly well get there. Council yeah, so Lake. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, with respect to the gateway checks, the question regarding who, who makes the decisions to pass through them, um, my understanding is that it is always the organisations, and so this council will always take the decision on, on whether to pass those gateways. Um, the decision to pass through this first one is moving into the mobilisation stage where we will be part of the design team um i i i recognize uh, the vice chair's concerns but i i believe we are we do have a strong seat at the table to to make our, our case to protect uh, our local services yeah is there any more debate 
Right, we've got three recommendations. Are there any um, alterations on those or? Uh, yeah, Councillor Gottick. Uh, it may be that members have been reassured by the presence of, of the officer coming to join us, for which I am grateful. But I have spent considerable time in the last few days talking to members who did feel that to date we have not had enough democratic input for whatever reason into the process. And so it was certainly a considered view of several colleagues that we might soften these recommendations. If colleagues are reassured and don't wish to soften these recommendations, that is, of course, up to them. But I would like to put an amended two recommendations rather than the three that we currently have on the table for your consideration, please. So with your permission, Chairman, I will... Yeah, carry on, carry on. I'll come back to you in a moment, Ashley. Is that OK? Yeah. No, and perhaps Ashley would like yeah. to come in first. I'm quite happy that yeah. she does. I just, I'm, I'm, I just want to say from, you know, as the DAS and DCSA, I mean, I really welcome this. Lots of what's talked about in here we do anyway, but this just gives us a formal framework in which we are both forced into a room and want to be in that room. I think when you um, look at services for residents, the are silly. Some of the biggest difficulties have been how health services have been historically commissioned back in the old days of the primary care trust, <coughs> where they didn't actually factor in delivery to remote islands. And actually that's been one of the greatest difficulties. I think what um, Adrian was alluding to earlier when he was concerned about a person, that is absolutely about the kind of safe discharge of island residents from Trillis. This is our best possible opportunity to be part of those conversations when all the new contracts come up for review. Um, next month, I'll be bringing a similar paper around children's services and One Vision and about being at the table. But if we're not at the table, we haven't got a chance of addressing anything. So avoiding this process, I think, would be crazy. But I think we've got to be in there. I, don't, there's, there's, I have had no indication whatsoever that the services which we provide currently, like care, that anyone's got any ambition to have them off us, uh, unfortunately, sometimes. But um, so we're absolutely clear that the local accountability of the DAS, of DCS, the lead member for adults, the lead member for children always remain. But it, it just enables us to flush out some of these conditions, these issues that people in our community tell about us, tell us all the time that things go pretty well on the islands in terms of health and social care, but slightly fall apart when you get to acute services. I'd just like to say that my amended recommendation absolutely expects that you will still be at the table. And is just as I mentioned earlier, looking for some greater clarity into the practical ramifications of what is actually And I think, and I think that's what Helen proposed. today, I think, has made that clarity come alive a lot more, because I think the paperwork is quite dense, to be honest, and all of us professionals who look at this kind of, it is dense, and that, that can make you concerned. But I think Helen's painted a picture now, which is, I think, a lot more reassuring. I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. What I suggest then is that I read my recommended changes and I'm quite happy to ask for the officer's comment on that before we proceed to a vote. And in fact, I would appreciate comment from both Ms Khan and from Ms Charles. Would that be a way forward, yeah, Chairman? Carry on. Yeah. Right. Having discussed at length with the chairman the report yesterday evening when he got back from the mainland and having had conversations with several members over the past few days, I have come up with these form of words for your um, consideration. That recommendation one would be that members note the requirements of the outline business case and approve in principle moves to support continuing work on an approach to integrated strategic commissioning, which is a slight softening of the words, but I believe no real change. But that instead of two and three, we actually have at two, members support continuing close cooperation and engagement with all partners, whilst seeking greater clarification of the practical ramifications and outcomes for residents of the Isles of Scilly. The only change is that we have not endorsed fully the move to the mobilization phase at this stage. However, I am sure that with greater clarity into the outcomes, we would be able to do this in a very short space of time. Do you want to pass comment on that, Ashley? I, I think, I, I actually understand 
exactly why you drafted that by reading the papers. I think now having had Helen's clarity about how the gateways work, what we're actually approving is doing that piece of work. So the, the next piece of work that we're going to approve, <coughs> so mobilization, I think that's why that's worrying, because that sounds like that's immediately happening. Money might be moving, people might be moving, but actually what, what we mean by mobilization is starting to do the work which spells out the opportunities, risks, etc. So if, if, if members now understand, and as I now do, what the next phase is, I think actually it entirely is exactly what you said. That's what that piece of work will be. So I think we can be much more reassured about what the word mobilisation means. I don't think it's so we are going to get more papers at some point before September yeah. about the progress of this. Yeah. I think that's not clear, not, not clear in the papers and the recommendations. You've made that a bit clearer, but I think you need to be a bit more explicit with your timetable and when. So we're not going to hold you to say, right, we're having stuff in June, June or July, but the implication is there. So, yeah. It's, in, it, the, the, it's, in, it's going to come in June. So, yeah, in that principle, I'm happy to propose the, rec the current recommendations. Uh, Councillor so, Williams. I just have one simple question I've just been processing in my head. We are in control of our own destiny. Yes. And as Adrian said, we're one quarter of a group, which is disproportionate to our financial contribution and population. So... The gateway, and, 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 and at the risk of repeating myself, the gateway is us. Uh, this elected body is the gateway. That's my understanding entirely. Okay, we have a proposal at the moment. We've heard Councillor Grotick's suggestions. That didn't come as a proposal yet, but we have a proposal for the recommendations. Do we have a seconder for it or not? I've got a seconder. Councillor Legg. Councillor Francis, you want Sorry, to Sorry, Chairman, could I just ask Councillor Grotick whether she um, wishes to pursue her proposal or does she wish to change that? Please. I am happy to listen and take advice from the two officers at the table. However, I do suggest moving forward that possibly we might just put in at recommendation three that members endorse the move to a mobilisation phase subject to ratification at a later full council, just to endorse within the recommendation and set, if you like, in stone and writing that all good intentions and the paperwork and everything will flow as we believe it will. Uh, my, uh, I think maybe we need to put the June date in here because actually at the moment we've got autumn, but I think June is really critical. So if we could put that, maybe slot that into the recommendation and everyone knows we're kind of every couple of months we're going to be having. And I am mindful that we are actually missing several key colleagues around this table for whatever reason, well, for family reasons. So I know, I know Councillor Marcus was telling me that is. Um, so why don't we say subject to gateway check two presented to full council in June? So that to, are you, are you I'm proposing that change to recommendation three. So you're, you're proposing, that. Right, so you're yeah. proposing one, two, and three with the alteration of from the phrase of autumn 18 to June 18. No, 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 no. no. Proposal three will read that members. Oh, sorry, of, sorry, misunderstanding. Yeah. You, you propose it comes to full council in June then? Yes, so the last sentence is subject to gateway check two, which will be presented to full council in June 2018. Right, yeah. Sorry, I'm on the same page Sorry. now. <laughs> um, Councillor Marcus, can I add a uh, presented to full council in June for ratification? Is that the understanding? I mean, it's implicit in the presentation. Okay. Implicit. Right. So we've got the proposal then. Are you, you're content with that now? Yeah. Right. Second that. And it's been seconded. So we've got one, two, and three with gateway check uh, addition of June 18. All those in favour? That's uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. You can go and catch your plane now. Thank you. We look forward to working with you again. Thanks very much. Uh, 
chair. Just just for the record, my uh, my seconding still stands with the change. Sorry, I'm I'm just post. Um, I'm seconding the change. Fine. Just just for the record. Just for the record, okay. All right. I thought I seconded the change. No, he, he accepted the seconding with the change because he proposed the original one. Right. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Right. Right. We have we have a, a potential minor problem that's cropping up because of uh, weather constraints. A monitoring officer may have to de depart slightly, officer. So I am going to go slightly off piste with the. Uh, uh, agenda list. We are going now to take the financial papers and then we're going to go on to the ones where we need um, uh, Matt's input, as in um, member allowances in particular, and 151 officers. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's um, external influences such as weather which leaves us out of control of this but we we'll go straight on now uh, to the annual government statement uh, which is su supplement pack one yeah right uh, Andy can you hear me uh, do you want to pass comment on this or Thank you. 
Yeah, there's a couple, a couple of points that I would, I would uh, raise on the governance statement. Um, one of them is that I think we are all very aware that we've made significant progress in the last 12 months, but there is still work to be done. I think that's what you were just saying um, in in your summary there, Andy. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, the other, the other one is a a factual point on page 13. Uh, right at the top of the paragraph, 4.4.1, the last sentence says the six recommendations were made to council. They were, but there's only five there. Have you missed one off or not? Right, thank you. Um, those are my points to start with. Are there any other questions of uh, our 151 officer on the governance statement, uh, Councillor Grotti? Well, it's not so much a question, um, Mr. Brown, it, it's more an assurance that the chairman and myself um, are very keen to discuss with the newly appointed 151 officer when he is in post the continuing progress and monitoring of the issues that you have raised so that there's an awful lot in this report. Um, we don't intend that this report goes on the back burner. We intend um, bringing the issues and constant monitoring of the issues that you have raised to future meetings of council for progress reports with the support and help of the new 151 officer. <coughs> Councillor Marcus. Yeah, um, this annual governance statement, I recognise quite a lot of this, seeing as um, I wrote most of this, and it's pretty much the same as the year before um, when I was an employee. Um, I understand that we're late and that there is time pressures on your time as well, Andy, um, but 4.2 on page 12, that's a copy and paste from the year before, so um, just... You know, it's hard for me as a councillor to take assurance when things haven't been checked and done properly. There's also on page, um, so we talk about risk assessments on page nine, uh, the middle, there's point three six three, the middle three six three, not the top one or the bottom one, um, talks about risk assessments. Um, I haven't seen a risk assessment for 12 months. Um, so, you know, in order to take assurance that actually this is a statement of how governance is working in the organisation, a lot of it's got to be on trust. It's not really, you know, I understand the points that you make in the back as well, but um, I find it challenging to take assurance from this document. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what to suggest, really. Councillor Francis, uh, I have to say, Chairman, uh, I'm in full agreement with uh, Councillor Marcus. Um, facts are as well that there's a number of us councillors sitting here that weren't even here in 1617. It's very difficult for us to um, assess this, and I don't know why we're even sitting here today discussing. 1617 it should have been dealt with a long, long time ago, but we know the reasons why. Um, but I have to say, not just financial issues, but there's a number of other issue, issues in here which uh, I'm not comfortable with um, and um, don't have any confidence as yet that um, they are actually uh, in place and working as is stated. And um, we haven't even got it signed off. Um, there's no signature under leader or chief executive on my page. Um, no, that's what we're that's what we're asking for. Is, well, uh, yeah. yeah. Not, okay, don't sorry. Forget, don't forget, yeah, just, one, okay, just, one, I, just one point. Is yeah, it's my that, age, Chairman. I'm sorry. I was sorry. thinking it was um, the doc. You know, the document. No, it being, hasn't been signed off yeah. yet. No, that's entirely. Um, but I'm sorry. I I, uh, I I personally need further comfort before I could put my hand up. This is this. this just just for clarity, this is 1617 we're talking about, not the current yeah. year. Yeah. 
well, this is 1617, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But um, I don't know about that because I wasn't here. But um, so how can I sort of agree to it? That's what I'm saying. Right. Um, and I'm not confident that what is stated in here is happening now. Right. Councillor Marcus? No. Um, I can propose that uh, we don't accept this and it's being brought back again next month, basically, with some more work done on it. Sorry. But um, it's there are sections which have been copied and pasted from the year before. So I think we need to just. Yeah, so, uh, so, uh, I think we're all suffering a bit of in terms of it. Uh, Marcus is spot on. It, it, this is effectively the 1516 AGS updating significantly for the uh, significant issues as I saw that. is if you look on page 14 the conclusion the last paragraph the council's governance arrangements were recognized as weak in relation to the finance and generally fit for purpose in most other areas in accordance so we, there is a, a caveat right at the end of it that this was very weak sorry to use your word caveat Andy but it is that's exactly what it is at the end of it yeah, as a memorial to Andy's post, we could put the word caveat in there as well, I think. Yeah. So, uh, but, um, Councillor yeah, so Rogers, in that relation, in that final paragraph, uh, and considering we're, we're all reticent to look at 1617, do we have to wait another year before we look at 1718? No. So, when will, uh, when will we, when will we have the chance to look at 1718? No. Uh, in line with the annual accounts. So, when the, um, the accounts are well, uh, likely to be late, but they'll be earlier than they have been in the last couple of, couple of years, and uh, the ATS will be approved as it should be as part of the statements as well. So, it'll be, um, we are currently looking at that being September. Okay, thank you. But, I, I should have to swear, there's, no, there's nothing actually. Stopping this council, uh, asking the end of the statement to be brought sooner. Can I just ask the monitoring officer um, if there are any implications in deferring this signature or not? It, that's what I was meaning, yeah. Just to explain that to everybody that that's, the accounts would not be closed for the year. Mr. Marcus, uh, I, I mean, if we can get the annual the seventeen eighteen annual governance statement sooner, 
maybe have some input on that one as a more live document. Um, I'm willing to um, to pass this as just you know we need to we do need to draw the line in 1617 say That's it's done precisely what we're doing and with it. Yeah. acknowledge that there are caveats and were issues around that period um so yeah so maybe yes so that's it really. is that a proposal is that i think that perhaps a proposal on um a date and if with regards to 17 8, 18 being brought forward that that will be brought forward as soon as possible we we're, we're still working through obviously the new system but it'll be sooner than last the last year but it will be late compared with a normal cycle well can we put a date on that rather than as soon as possible i think that's going to be very difficult to actually put a physical date on it but um, well mr brown's and, just and, said and it was by september can I ask, yeah. can I just ask the chief executive shall, on shall that? i make going to make a proposal is that um, clearly the annual government statement can only be signed and finalized once the accounts have been completed but what we could um, add as a recommendation is that a paper is brought to full council as a draft if you like of the annual government statement say by June so that members can consider the draft provide further input um, even if required and then that we finalize the uh, government statement and based on the draft and input from members by well September whenever the accounts are yeah that completed. sounds are you reasonable. content with that yep right okay so we are, we are you proposing that we take this as it is with the caveat at the bottom of it at the on the conclusion that it is signed off now or not yeah I'll propose that have we got a second it second it vice chair second it we have a proposal and a second. All those in favour? Against? Abstentions? One abstention. Thank you. Moving on. Um, Andy, the uh, annual Treasury Management Strategy, please. Yeah, okay, Chair. So this is, uh, it's actually not good that we have to prepare the budget for the year. So this is actually not good that we have to prepare every year. Treasury Management Strategy for 18-19, uh, four
questions councillor williams um yeah just two queries um what would be the duration of the loan for the million we're looking to take out um in the short term uh, also in regard to the comment about our investments i was just wondering if we need if we do invest are there any considerations around um the ethical placement of our funds i'm just conscious i don't necessarily want to be approving a plan around um uh, supporting children and young people one day, then finding out our investment has gone into uh, uh, something, some, something unethical. So, yeah, two points, the duration of our loan and the sort of ethical position of our investments. So, just back on the Yeah, you mentioned you're looking to take out the loan for the um, one million pounds in the near future. How long yeah. would that take to pay off? See your question. Right. Councillor Smith? Well, I'd like to just pick up on the point of Councillor Williams of ethical investment. I think um, going forward, I'd like to see us develop some sort of strategy on it as and when we do have money to invest. I think it's right and proper we should do it in as ethical a fashion as we can. I, I, I think we're all in that of, of that ilk and we need to examine that in the future. 
Are you all content that we push that one into the future? I'm not going to take a vote on it, but it, uh, an acknowledgement is that we, we, I think we are all aware of it. Okay. Um, in that case, we have four recommendations. Uh, I propose that we take them all as one block. Is there a proposal for the four recommendations? Councillor uh, so Francis, seconded by uh, Councillor Davis. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, revenue monitoring. Andy, it's you again, please. to kick it off with um, on the uh, appendix one on page 38 uh, active silly appears to have made a massive saving have you got a little bit more expansion on that huge saving or not I, I, I'll pass over to the chief exec yeah, th th thank you thank you chairman um, there's a number of reasons for active silly um, where we are in terms of the budget um, members will be aware there was a significant um, lack of resource into Akasili and we've been recruiting quite heavily trying to get the right people in place which did deliver some significant savings. Um, also um, the way that the Akasili team are now operating is very much focused on the income generating uh, going forward and so we've, we've put a lot of attention on that and actually been very successful in, in selling packages uh, to support Akasili. Um, and finally, there are some big bills still um, coming, uh, particularly in relation to the uh, building itself, uh, i.e. heating and, and some of the bills that will be coming forward. Fine. Thank you. The, the, other, the other question, which I probably actually know the answer to, is that uh, uh, environmental health has got uh, a, a significant saving as well. I, I understand that was because of the late, appointment of uh, the HOs. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Right. Are there any more questions? Councillor Williams. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just had three quick questions. One related to 2.4, the main the challenging transition. I was just wondering for an update on that to see where we are. Um, I wondered whether in the future park cash and adult social care could be separated on the Appendix 1. Um, it talks about adult social care offsetting Park House, so I don't feel we necessarily get a clear picture of the two um, being differentiated. And also a query about invoicing relating to Park House, that's a sentence in the report. I wondered if um, there was any update on the invoicing situation, so cash flow. Uh, um, yeah, invoicing has been resolved. Um, I'm sure we can split, split out Park House. Um, actually, Park House and um, increased costs was only for the first six months while we got ourselves sorted. We haven't actually employed agency staff for the last six months. So I'm hoping in the next financial year that I can minimize that spend entirely. But we have made significant efficiencies in 
adult social care itself, which has offset that kind of overspend in Park House. So we have managed within budget. Um, also in children's services, we are trying to identify currently some uh, mitigation against the additional locum social worker. And we've just received 15,000 pounds from the NHS to support emotional health and wellbeing on the islands. So good stuff. Are there any more questions? Oh, sorry, uh, Vice Chair. Just a small point for accuracy at 2.3 on page 36. Um, we seem to be getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Well, as we approach the end of the 18-19 financial year, we're at the end, surely, of the 17-18 financial year, yeah. are we not? <laughs> Typo. <laughs> yeah. Right. Are there any... Oh, Councillor Smith? Thank you, Chair. Um, overall comment, I mean, it still seems that a lot of the savings are due to staff vacancies, as we picked up before. So that is potentially a concern going forward in terms of where we are with our budget. Just a specific question, please, on uh, Port Mellon Enterprise Centre, uh, where it stated we got on, on page 41 and uh, a number of units remain vacant. Um, can I get assurance whether this uh, is, is making a loss of profit, it's breaking even a sense of how that's going, please? Craig, do you want to comment on that, please? Yeah, yes, Chairman, very briefly. It, clearly, it is a budget pressure because obviously the vacancies do create a tension in terms of the amount of income versus expenditure. We're doing everything we can to market those, those units. We do have interest in the units. Certainly, we have interest in two of the units plus the kitchen. But as yet, we have no confirmation that they will be taken up. So can you confirm whether it's making a, a, a profit loss break even, please? Uh, I would say I would say at this stage it's making a loss. Uh, can you qual qualify that, quantify that at all? The, the quantification is actually in the actually in the budget papers themselves. Specifically, I, I haven't got the details in terms of the in terms of the PEC, but obviously. Uh, in terms of natural resources and assets, it is showing, it is showing obviously, an overspend. And that's in, not entirely because of the PEC, because that's also because of the capital works as well, both the Wesleyan Chapel Town Hall and other corporate property uh, as a, in terms of the ICT improvements and all those other things. So, but it, it is actually showing, you know, as part of the budget pressure actually within that line. Any more questions? Um, we have two recommendations. Uh, I intend to take them as one um, recommendation, one that the Council notes revenue budget and the delegated authority be given to the 151 officer. Have we got a proposal for those two, please? Proposed by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Francis. Uh, all those in favour? That's unanimous, thank you. Right. Um, now, I, this is where I am. Yeah, I am going to start moving the agenda around a moment uh, because of potential loss of our monitoring officer. Um, we are now going to move on to item 16. Okay. Page 79 to 112. Member allowances. Thank you, Chair. So, um, so long, long outstanding, I suppose, this report. Um, uh, I've reported previously, or we've reported previously to Council that the arrangements for the Council of the Isles of Scilly to review its allowances are, are slightly different to other councils because of the way the, the uh, relevant regulations are applied. Um, you, you've got appended to the report um, the report of Declan Hall, who um, is an expert in member allowances. And he's made a number of recommendations, uh, which I've captured at paragraph six of this report. <coughs> uh, one of the things that I haven't put in the report that I should have, so uh, remiss of me and I'm sorry, is that there is a legal requirement uh, before the beginning of each year, so before, before 1st of April each year, uh, for the council to uh, make a scheme for the payment of basic allowance for the ensuing year. Um, so that has to be done, otherwise you're in breach of that uh, statutory requirement. Um, the recommendations I've put before you are that you accept the recommendations of Declan Hall. I thought it appropriate to do that, but you don't necessarily need to agree with those recommendations, and you are able to, to do something different 
if that's your wish. <coughs> um, the second recommendation I put in about tightening, tightening up how uh, approved duties are determined. Uh, you can leave the arrangements as they currently are, or you can add a little bit of certainty to your scheme, so that's less critical. Um, the very minimum thing you need to do today is to set a basic allowance for 1819. Uh, if you do more than that, all well and good. If you don't, then at a point in time, you'll want to be reconsidering what you do in relation to those other allowances, the SRAs, etc. I'll leave it at that, Chair, but I'm happy to help with questions if I can. I'd just like to make um, a comment from the Chair is that what Matt says is that we need to set something now. What we do uh, is entirely up to us. However, the one thing that I would like to emphasise is that if we set something now, it is not unalterable in the future. We can revisit it at any time in the next 12 months. Councillor Francis. Um, could I ask, please, um, Mr Stokes, um, and it may be my age, but I don't quite understand in point nine on page 82, uh, it states that the 2018-19 whole year cost, excluding travel and expenses, uh, is 105,453. Um, but under our financial implications, across the page, on page 83, um, at uh, point 15, it says the 2018-19 budget set at full council in February includes the reduction in the base budget at 99,000 for members' allowances, subsistence and travel included. So I don't quite understand that. Could you explain, please? So, um, so the budget that you said in February for members' allowances, including travel and subsistence, is £99,000. The, the total of allowances, based on Declan Hall's report, um, excluding travel and subsistence, uh, and indexed with a 2% increase, would be 105453 And so that would create a budget pressure because the cost of that is going to be more than the budget you've set. Uh, thank you. Um, that's uh, exactly my point, that we've set a budget and yet we've now been presented with this again with two days to think about it and having to make a decision by the end of March. Um, there are a lot of uh, councillors here that deserve these in increases and we are way underneath most other councils in the country, if not all, in that level. So I don't disagree with um, uh, Dr. Hall's um, recommendations. However, it is unacceptable, in my view, um, for us to um, agree to go over budget that we've just set when this council has been through the last two or three years of considerable financial pressure that we're trying to address and then for us to agree that we take an increase and go over budget um, so we're left in a in a quandary in my view and and i don't see how we can agree to this Councillor marcus yeah i share um robert's frustrations in that the report is dated january we set the budget in february and now we're presented with this report in March. Um, surely, uh, yeah, it's just frustrating that if we approve the report, then we are going to effectively break our own budget setting. Um, I don't know what to do. The, um, uh, yeah, I'm at a loss. Thank you, Chairman. If I could just say in a way, the setting of a budget. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, Uh, together with the reduction of the members, uh, not the reduction of 
uh, sorry, the reduction in land bills and the change in governance. So uh, it's not the budget that we've just set, it was the budget that was set a year ago. So it's a bit of confusion. Uh, just for a bit of clarity there, it was about the budget that was set in January 2017, we did set the budget for 2017 so what is the budget we've set this year for next year's? The budget for that we've set next year we really increased in terms of two percent, not increased in terms of in terms of base. So the nine thousand sorry, we have the nine thousand next year is still is still the base budget for eighteen nineteen. Absolutely. We would be going over budget. Uh, uh, Councillor Rogers, uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Francis and Marcus uh, with regards to the going over budget situation. I, I would also add and I agree with Councillor Francis that there are many members that, that deserve uh, remuneration in, in various levels, but we're asking our council officers to cut across the board in order to make savings, uh, looking at going over budget here and making increases in various areas. Um, I think we need to have a, uh, another report which can keep us within budget and at the same time uh, by rejigging the allowances, um, show some significant decrease in these in order to bring us in line with what we're asking um, our council to do as well. And at can the same I, time, just can I interject? Measuring on, that, on that one. I, that I, I pick up, I pick up members' concerns about budget pressures, and I've got exactly the same concerns about that. Uh, however, um, I, I can suggest from the chair a potential way forward as we are looking at the moment is that we remain as we are this year without increasing the members allowances and examine the way forward as far as looking at lead members allowances is by reconvening the democratic processes panel to have a look at that uh, because we can alter members allowances after we've set them this year the fact that we set them and we can leave them as they are this year will not increase the budget pressures but we can look at as a body going forward via the democratic processes panel that is a suggestion not a proposal from the chair um vice chair uh, can i just ask mr roger if he's actually finished what he was saying because i think inadvertently he we perhaps i just wanted to qualify quickly. the comments by saying I, and the chair's just alluded to it with the lead members of uh, the new lead members role that there must be a better way to present this so that those that give the most time get the most remuneration and at the same time show some savings to the whole budget vice chair if i could just say the chairman and i were discussing this yesterday um and i would like to see that we immediately reconvene the democratic processes panel and we take this paper to the democratic <coughs> processes panel but we twin it with the general review of the new governance arrangements in other words the um dissolving of the committees and the establishment of the lead member roles and how it's actually working and i think that would perhaps cover some of the issues i can see Councillor Mark is shaking his head. I'll let him come. I'll ask the chair to let him come back in a minute. I would also like to say that I don't approve and can't approve number two, which is that the determination of approved duties should be subject to the Democratic um, Services Department in consultation with the Chief Executive and the Monitoring Officer. I think a member doing a professional role should be perfectly able to decide whether or not they see the need to go to a meeting. Uh, and obviously, if there was an issue where a member was effectively abusing the system, I'm sure we could find another way of dealing with it. Right, Councillor Marcus. Um, I am, yeah, I think just to reiterate the point before, I'm frustrated that we didn't have a DPP with this report presented earlier. Um, frustrated that budget was set with this report being in our possession and that wasn't reflected in the budget, um, that should 
not happen. Um, I think that the report on the whole by Mr. Hall is really good, really thoughtful, um, explains his thinking clearly. You know, the, um, the allowances we have at the moment are based on 2006 daily rates, which are totally out of kilter. We're 12 years ahead of that now. Um, it is not sustainable for people it's only sustainable for per certain people to be a councillor. We should be encouraging the diversity and encouraging people who do have businesses to um, and families and have uh, dependents to become councillors. Um, I think it's not a, and Declan's point about lead member roles being in their infancy is very valid. We have this doing various jobs. We have no definition about their roles and no targets and goals. We talk about officers not being set goals. We have to have that fed back on ourselves as well. It's great that we have lead members doing loads of work, but unless we have goals and targets and we are agreed on those goals and targets, we can't justify their work and pay them on an hourly basis. It's got to be set down in writing. So, um, Put off is frustrating. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Yes, I find it very difficult to um, to put it off again because um, it is affecting me personally. So, so how, I can't. How do we wish to proceed moving forward with this? Well, I understand from uh, the debate so far that there is obviously concerns about. Um, uh, about budgetary pressures and also uh, the democratic process. Uh, do you wish to push this through to the dem democratic processes panel or um, do you wish to make a decision now? It, it's entirely up to the elected members. It's not me that's taking this decision. <laughs> yeah, we've got to, we've got to have a, a screen, um, certainly. Um, uh, yeah. Minimum thing is that basic Yeah, exactly. But then we potentially could re examine it going forward via the DPP. We, could, we can alter it. <coughs> My understanding, having spoken to uh, uh, Matt, is that we can alter it within a month if we wish to. We don't, it's not casting tablets of stone for the next 12 months. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I find this is all quite a strange process for a lot of reasons already set out, and, and the fact that we're effectively voting through potentially our own pay increases. Sort of minds go towards uh, MPs doing the same thing. Um, however, you know, uh, I would absolutely stand by what Councillor Marcus says, and, and, and actually we are way behind where we should be in terms of members' allowances. We do have to attract more people in a greater diversity, and, and, and you have to, frankly, just pay pay a bit more for that. We are all working for pretty low rates if we're doing our job properly. I would happily stand up in public and defend that, even if it's a 20% pay increase, because we've been for years below where we should be. Um, so with, in mind with what the monitoring officer said, I would support the increase in the basic allowance. Um, in regards to the other uh, allowances, uh, I think it needs a lot more looking at um, I am actually very dismayed that there's no SRA for lead members, to, regardless of what Councillor Marcus says. I think, frankly, it's about you put time in, and a lot of us lead members are really putting a lot of time in and getting nothing for it. And it's not just about the money, it's about the signal, about the symbolism of what that means, that role. And, and frankly, you know, if you talk about workload, well, I'm afraid if we compare it to, I, I don't know what the chairman of licensing does, but we haven't had a licensing committee in 12 months. So if you're going to compare workloads, I'm sorry that it's, you know, that's where this, this work needs to be done. Uh, this, I don't think these, these recommendations, other than the basic allowance, are really fit for purpose at the moment and, and in, in mind of the budget pressures as well. Councillor Davis. Well, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement with, with what Jonathan says, Councillor Jonathan Smith says. But I, I, I struggle with this because obviously we're personally involved. But there's more, there's more to life than just money. And part of the allowances actually shows the recognition of the, of the position. 
just as the B the women in the BB who work for the BBC don't expect to get more money, they want equality and they want recognition for the job equally done. So it's recognition of position comes into this. And to, to put the the, the, the chairman of scrutiny on the same level as our vice chairman, I think is totally wrong. I think even more wrong, as Jonathan's just said about um, the licensing committee, every, every, every area has actually had an increase except for the adults area. This is where I, I struggle a bit because obviously I uh, appear to be batting on, you know, for myself. But this report actually increases the amount paid for fish and licensing, but more than uh, the adults in the, 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 the adults and the vulnerable elderly in this community who I'm shouting for. I, I think people know in this room that, that I've done a lot over and beyond uh, my defined area and my role profile uh, with, some, with some possible success in the near future. So I, I think it's very difficult and I think it should obviously go back for further discussion and I would support making the decision we have to make to, on the basic allowance uh, by the end of this month, uh, but, for, but asking the DPP to reconsider this situation. So where do we, where do we move forward with this one? Council Leg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I find myself surrounded by, by lead members um, who are incredibly <laughs> hardworking. Um, parts of this this council um, and recognize what they're all saying you know they they're working very hard and they see others working very hard but not being recognized um, and 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 feeling unappreciated um, we are nearly 12 months into the, this new council and new form of of running this space um, I, I feel it should go to the democratic processes panel um, to to look into this further. Um, I think for now we should just look at the basic allowance. Councillor Williams. Um, yeah, we're in an absolutely impossible position, aren't we? We spoke about um, ethical investing 20 minutes ago. How ethical is it to send out council tax with a 6% increase while we give ourselves a 20% increase? It's, it, it, there's never a good time, but today isn't the time to make some of these decisions when there's so much uncertainty. I would just urge that when, if we do go down the route of the democratic processes panel, those, minutes are, those meetings are minuted and are attached as appendices because I think transparency in this discussion more than any others is um, particularly important. Councillor so, Grotick. Thank you, Chairman. I agree that the 20% increase does look like a lot, but if you look at the comparison with other unitary authorities right the way through the UK, we, our allowances are extremely low. I am very worried. I'm very pleased on the one hand that we now have over 50% of our members that actually engage in, in employment. I think that's good and it's healthy for the authority. But it does mean that people who give up a day's work to attend a council meeting are actually disadvantaging themselves. If they can't go out fishing for a day or work on their farm, then they're actually significantly, or whatever else they do, they're actually giving to the community beyond their time. They're actually at a financial disadvantage. And I think that I would support a payment of the basic allowances and referral to the Democratic Processes Panel to look at the rest of the report in detail, but to twin it with a look at our governance arrangements, our new governance arrangements, how they're working, and I agree totally, transparently, and minute, minute everything. And secondly, I would ask that we actually turn down the approach at recommendation two. So it's recommendation number one would be that we approve the increase approve, um, in the basic allowance, backdated as... Professor Hall suggests that the rest of the report is brought to a speedy reconvening of the Democratic Processes Panel, which will consider in detail this report and a report, um, a look at our current working arrangements. And recommendation two that the approach proposed in the report, we'll take them separately, please, Chairman. The report, the approach proposed in the report relating to the termination of approved duties remain as it is. Councillor Francis. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Yeah, I, I hear everything that's been uh, said and, and uh, fully support all of it. Um, however, I, I can't agree with Councillor Grotick at the moment that, um, that we can support the increase. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, Mr Chairman, I think we, we should look at your suggestion. Um, we need to agree to keep within our budget that was set, whether we like it or not, for now. And then it needs to go um, through the democratic processes panel and, and um, presumably, it, you know, when we get agreement on those results, we can then, you know, see whether we can find the money or whatever. But um, uh, that that would be my take, Chairman. Right. Um, I, I don't wish to curtail debate at all. However, I think we need to move on with this. We haven't got a proposal yet on the table. Would somebody like to put one? She isn't proposed. She isn't proposed. No. Right. Well, I would like to, to make a proposal along the lines that I've just said, uh, Chairman, but I, I would leave it to our monitoring officer to decide how he wishes to word it. But I, I, um, I do feel that we should keep the allowances within budget uh, uh, now, um, but it to be referred to the Democratic Processes Panel. Right. Is there a second for that? We have a second of Councillor Davis. Okay, sorry, Councillor Smith. Well, I'd like to propose actually that uh, we um, agree with the increase in the basic allowance. Um, I think Declan Hall's report makes it very clear why he proposes that. Um, clearly, the rates of remuneration are way below what other councils do, and they have been set low for years. Um, and for that reason, and actually, I think, you know, the, the amount of days per year that he reckons uh, councils use, well, I, I certainly work more than that. So, if, so for that sense, I think it sends the right message towards members that you remunerate them for the work done. And so I'm going to propose that we recommend an increase in the basic uh, allowance and that the other allowances, the SRAs, et cetera, and committee chairman are, go through the democratic processes panel to be convened at as soon as possible. So can I ask someone to do some quick calculations? If we increase the basic member, sh member SRA, are we still in budget and keep just the lead member for children's and the um, chairman and vice chair allowances as they are now? Are we still in budget? I need to know that. I can't. I can't. Well, can someone? That without, we can. Can we convene? Can we adjourn till we know that? Because we can't make budgetary decisions without. I don't, I don't think that's information that would be available immediately, is it, Andy? 16 times 800. Assuming that everyone declares, uh, actually takes the allowance, it's an impossible figure to come up with here and now. <laughs> Councillor Francis. Can I suggest, Mr Chairman, that maybe we uh, go on to another agenda item while um, uh, our good 151 officer has got his calculator out, or is that uh, unreasonable? No, we, we, we can't move. We're halfway no, yeah. through. We've got two proposals on the table anyway. Okay. Right, we've got we've got a, uh, a a proposal that hasn't been seconded by Councillor Smith at the moment. Yeah, I'll second that, Chairman. I think the amount is small, and I'm sure we can judge find some small amount if right. it's passed. Okay, we we have we have two proposals. The first one I'll, I'll take them in order of, as they came up. The first one was by Councillor Francis to keep the allowances as they are at the moment and refer any uh, increases to the democratic processes panel. Is that correct, Councillor Francis? That was seconded by Councillor Davis. Can I have all in favour, please? Against? Motion lost. The second uh, motion was proposed by Councillor Smith that we accept the uh, recommendations set out uh, in the appendix basic uh, on sorry, basic allowances. No. no. The, the no sorry, have I got that wrong? They accept the increase in the basic allowance from 3489 to 4209. 
and secondly, for all other payments, SRAs, that that goes to the democratic processes panel, which meets as soon as possible. Fine. Okay. Can, can I just clarify? When will that be effective from? You mean the basic allowance? Yes. From the 1st of April, 2018. 17 or 18? Is it backdated? Uh, 2018. Right, from 1918 rather than 1917. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you, can, you, can you reiterate, just for clarity, please? So the basic allowance is increased from 3,489 to 4,209 as of the 1st of April 2018, and that the, the SRAs are determined by the Democratic Processes Panel, which meets as soon as possible. All right. Are so we just clear with that now. Just Especially. to confirm, there'll be no other SRAs paid. There'll be no lead member payments. There'll be no chairman of council payments. Just so you all know, until an, another figure's been agreed. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I'm taking that proposal as meaning that every other SRA who makes a certain amount of money will get paid. Sorry, yes, I did. So yes, yes. Children. Remains as current. So all the SRAs stay Do the same at the moment. Yes. The basic allowance is increased as the quote you are, and everything else is re-examined by the DPP. Yes. Are we all clear on that, especially me? <laughs> right, we have that proposed, we have it seconded, all those in favour? One, two, against. Motion carried, thank you. <sighs> right. Sorry. Uh, we've got the second part of the proposal, which is on the paper. The approach proposed in the report relating to the determination of approved duties and that council member allowance scheme is amended accordingly. Councillor Grossi. I'd like to make a proposal that this approach is not accepted and that the, the approach with regard to approved duties remains as it is at the moment. Until examined by the DPP. Uh, yes, I'm quite happy for it to come to DPP. Right. We got a seconder for that? Seconded by Councillor Smith. All those in favour? I think that was unanimous. Right, we can move on now. We are going to move now uh, to item 17 on the agenda, which is the appointment of the 151 officer. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, hopefully a relatively straightforward report. Members are aware that um, Andy uh, is now the Section 151 officer for Cornwall Council. And so there's a tension there. Um, hopefully uh, all or most members are familiar with Russell Ashman, who's been put forward by Cornwall Council as um, a, a replacement Section 151 officer for the Council of the Isles of Scilly. He's got the appropriate qualifications and experience. Um, uh, the suggestion is so that it's, uh, it matches financial years that Russell Ashman is appointed as the Council's Chief Financial Officer and Section 151 officer from the 1st of April. Um, any comments? Councillor Grottick. I've read the report and I'd like to propose that the Council appoint Russell Ashman as the Council's Chief Financial Officer in Section 151 Officer with effect from the 1st of April 2018. And from the Chair, I'm quite happy to second that proposal. Uh, I'd just like to thank Andy for his work and um, good humour whilst dealing with us. <laughs> happy to support that also. I already did it a week ago. <laughs> But yeah, I, I'm quite happy to reiterate that from the chair as well. What you've done, Andy, in difficult circumstances is appreciated, and I'd like to put it on record that it is appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Right, we have a proposal, uh, and it's been seconded, that uh, Russell Ashman is appointed. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Um, what else have we got? Oh, we've got to do to the uh, airport fees. Right, sorry to be leaping about here, there, and everywhere, uh, but now I'm going to move to item 13, 
uh, which is on pages 43 to 52, uh, airport fees and charges. And I'll actually wake Craig up at this juncture. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I am actually awake, believe it or not. So, so prim primarily the report recommends uh, an increase for fees and charges at the airport. These are commercial fees and charges and you see the recommendation is to increase them this year by 6%. Just for clarity, commercial fees and charges relate to the passenger load supplement and also fees and charges relating to landing fees and freight. You'll note from the report that the recommended increase of, of 6% is really due to the current financial situation of the airport. And that also includes obviously moving forward the investment and replacement plan, which is also attached to the report and also forms one of the recommendations. That investment plan we do actually review on an annual basis. So it is, it is subject to some change. You'll also see that the recommended increase of 6% has also had, had regard to discussions we've had with the steamship group, is clearly they are the sole commercial provider of the airport at the moment. It's only right and proper that we do actually discuss some of these issues with us. And as part of those discussions, we've, we've agreed uh, an estimated 98,000 passengers for next year. I appreciate that that figure is challenging, but we feel that it is actually achievable and that's for the reasons also set out in the report. You'll also see as part of the recommendation that to actually, as an incentive to increase passenger numbers, that we're recommending that fees and charges will decrease by 3% should the target figure of 98,000 passengers be reached in the next financial year. So that is an incentive also to increase passenger numbers. And of course, more passenger numbers means more income. There are four recommendations attached to the report. I've got nothing else to say, but obviously I will answer any questions that you may have. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this is, we're well aware that the airport, obviously the finances are very important and, and slightly challenging. Um, the recommendation of an increase in 6% fees uh, per passenger is not very significant, around 50 pence per person. Um, however, I, I think I'd like to just discuss around, we're talking about increases in income. The other side of the coin, of course, is cost control. Uh, referring on page 45 to paragraph 9, uh, it's stated the costs were slightly higher than anticipated, I'd say significantly, yeah. estimated 1.1 million, it's actually over 1.35 million. Can you explain why the costs were significantly higher and and most importantly, how we go forward in terms of controlling costs. Yeah, so the first thing I would say is that we do actually control costs and manage costs as best we can at the airport. The difficulty with something like an airport, it is a very complex operation. So you're absolutely right. I think the word slightly, I think, was probably misplaced actually in that paragraph. And, you know, I'll admit that because obviously the costs were roughly about £215,000 more than anticipated. That was in part because of some of the additional training that took place both in terms of the duty crew, but also more importantly in terms of air traffic, because the one thing that we do want to do is increase continuity and resilience. So we are growing, uh, we have a Grow Our Own initiative, which, and, and training for an air traffic controller is, is, is expensive. We've had all sorts of issues in terms of uh, repairs and maintenance to vital equipment, both in terms of air traffic and navigational aids, as well as some of our vehicles as well, and not least the aged uh, fire appliances. So there have been a number of unexpected cost pressures uh, during that year. Obviously, we continue continue to control those those pressures. My view for the budget for next year, hopefully, we'll be back on track, and it will be more akin to what we've had in previous years. But clearly, clearly, when you're dealing with something like an airport, there's absolutely no guarantee. Yeah, thank you. Um, I suppose the other comment I have around the anticipated target of 98,000 passengers a year, I find challenging. Uh, if we look at the, the history of the passenger numbers over the last four or five years, um, you know, we have, the closest we've been is, is 96,000, 2016-17. And I'm not really sure what the basis is on the increase in passenger numbers to take assurance that this is the right way forward. Okay, so on that point, so last year we were anticipating an increase of 100,000 passengers. Sorry, we were increasing, not an increase of 100,000 passengers. That would be a quite wishful thinking. 
Uh, and that means we wouldn't have probably a financial problem at the airport. But we were anticipating around 100,000, and that was actually based on, on growth since 2014-15. Since so the projections were we were, were going to hit 100,000. Now, there were a number of issues last year. I think there were a number of operational issues, both at the airport, because we had issues around air traffic. And also, I think it's safe to say that Skybus also had some operational issues as well. And so, so there was a little bit of disruption last year. So I think the picture is of, of 92,000, which we anticipate this year is only part of the story. And my view is that with, with more resilience in the operations, both at, at the airport itself, as well as with Skybus, I actually think we will see an additional trend. I think it's also dependent on, obviously, marketing through Island Partnership and, and various other businesses as well coming to the table and making sure that the islands you know, are being truly marketed and we are actually making the most opportunity for, for visitor numbers. And also there might be some smaller benefits as well in terms of EGNOS. We still have some issues in terms of EGNOS at our end, but we're hoping that two, at least two runways uh, which only require impact assessments rather than full consultation. So there might be some partial implementation of EGNOS during the next financial year. And, and also, because Land's End is slightly more ahead of us in terms of EGNOS, there might be some, some increased uh, resilience as well at Land's End for next year. So I think, all in all, 98,000 passenger num numbers for next year absolutely is challenging, potentially on the optimistic side, but my view is that we do everything we possibly can to increase increase passenger numbers by working in partnership, both with obviously the transport provider as well as Island Partnership. Thanks, Rogers. Um, I've got two points, but I'll pick up uh, first, uh, Craig, on your just your mentioning there of the Islands Partnership, and I should declare an interest, non pecuniary interest, as a director of that organisation. Um, would it not be fair, as you said, marketing all that side of things are vitally important? Would it not be fair once that 98,000 is triggered that the 3% discount is shared between the operator and the main marketing and number driver for these islands, the islands partnership? Chairman, I'm not quite sure that would, what that would mean in practice because we are just talking about fees and charges actually at the airport. We were giving the operator a 3% discount um, and that figures out of the air came to £10,000 discount in a 12-month period, providing that with, with the organisation that drives the volume. What about doing that in the future, maybe next year, being a bit more uh, it's, a thought, it's, a process. About, it's a way for the council yeah, yeah. to also engage some form of financial support to the partnership yeah. and would seem fair if that organisation is driving the marketing and the numbers that the operator uh, doesn't get the full benefit of that discount. It's ploughed back into the, that organisation. I thought, Ch Chairman, I think, uh, yeah, I can understand the thought process as well, but I think, uh, as, as Councillor Marcus says, I think we do need to give that a little bit more consideration before agreeing to something like that. Because the other thing I would say is we are always looking to review the kind of fees and charges model actually at the airport to make it work both for, obviously, the airport itself as well as the kind of you know the wider issues as well and the wider objective of actually promoting the islands as a as a destination. Yeah, I, I understand your thinking, Councillor Rogers, and I, I am not unsupportive of it. But however, I think we need to set this today without clouding the issue. I'm happy with that as long as it's been noted and, and it something for discussion on, in the future. Take, taken on board. Yeah. Okay. My second point was uh, to uh, Craig was you mentioned parking. Uh, in the income stream in point 10. Uh, can we have an update on when that's going to start? Ah, okay. So, <laughs> so, Chairman, I am still seeking advice from Cornwall Council because the legal implications of parking on these islands is a little bit more complex than, uh, than I first thought. And I think, actually, it's probably slightly more complex than Cornwall Council first thought as well because some of the statutory provisions, particularly the wider issues, because at the moment we're the only authority in the country where, dev where the police force actually has powers of parking enforcement. That doesn't happen anywhere else in the, in the UK. And that in itself is creating a bit of an issue. Can I, can I just ask a question on that one? <laughs> the we're same as last time when we discussed we're, it two we're, months we're ago. Talk, yeah. when, we're talking about parking at the airport, hmm. not enforcement within public roads. It's the whole thing. Ch 
Ch Chairman, it's slightly more complex than that because as a local authority, it does actually resonate potentially as well to on-street car parking as well. So I have re-emailed Cornwall for an update in terms of where we are because absolutely we need to drive as many income streams at the airport as possible. Car, car parking is never going to produce a significant amount of, of, <laughs> of, of, of income, but you know, as the advert says, every penny does count. Yeah, can I just ask that you put uh, some considerable effort into this one, Craig, on the grounds that I was pushing this when I was chairman of Tilly and it's been going on for too long. Thank you. Um, right, uh, Councillor Rogers, do you want to say anything else on that? Or are you no, I'm happy, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Um, thank you, Chairman. I'm always reluctant to base our budget setting on an optimistic position. I'd much rather have a realistic position, but, but I think the challenge is there. Um, I just wondered whether the Steamship Group were totally on board with this challenge. Um, I also had a query. You, you mentioned the ageing fire appliance. I wondered if we could have an update on the re-procurement of that. And in Section 10, where it talked about... Um, can, I, can I just uh, interject there? We're not talking about fire appliances at the moment, we're talking about fees and charges. Well, Craig did raise the ageing fire appliances. So Sorry? Yeah. Ch Chairman, no. I can give an update, because if you it, wish. it is relevant, because it is in the asset replacement okay. plan. And also, in terms of fees and charges, I wondered if it would be appropriate for lead member for place to be part of the, the delegation that's um, set out in 10, as it's sort of his budget area as much as anything as well. Obviously, in terms of the last point, I mean that's obviously a, a member decision. In terms of the in terms of the fire appliance, but I wouldn't have a problem with that. In terms of the fire appliance, we have uh, now procured a new fire appliance, and so hopefully that will arrive on the islands by the end of this financial year, all being well and subject to the programme that we've uh, next just, financial year. Chris. Sorry, next. Sorry, the end of this calendar year, I should say. Thank you. Did I say financial year? You did. So I mean, at the end of this calendar year. Councillor Marcus. Yeah, um, passenger numbers. Yeah, the increase in passenger number chimes with the destination management plan. The IP brought out yesterday, they are planning 5% increase in passenger numbers, well, hoping for a 5% increase over the next five years yearly. The increase from 92 to 98 is 6.5%. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that will happen. Um, just in terms of... Budget surplus, I'm aware that we has, and you, I might be incorrect, but Andy, have we been taking budget from, surplus budget from this, this trading account to prop up, prop up's probably the wrong word, but into the general reserve at all? Has that money been transferred over? And how much is that? Are you muted? We can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And I'd just like to add a, not a proposal, but just a more radical thought in that we should be supporting the count, the airport to be its own standalone business. So it can react and it can be innovative in the way that it deals with fees and charges, which can, like you and said, help fund other bodies. So I don't know what the best way of ensuring that that 
happens because this has been a thought that's gone on for quite some time. We naturally need to do something about it, I think, and be a bit more radical and brave and let the airport do its own thing. So um, I don't know, Chairman, if we can build some plan or it does, chief executive. It, it has been spoken about. Uh, but we need to I, have it we, down in writing, not just we haven't words. Yet, no, but it, has, it, it, it certainly has been discussed. I've discussed it with Craig and, and the chief exec on, on several occasions. Uh, however, we are at the moment, uh, it's a legal requirement that the airport uh, does not make a loss. So that's where we are, and we, as we stand at the moment legally, as a, an authority, are responsible for the operation and setting the fees and charges at the moment. And I'd like that to change okay. at some point in the future. Your suggestion has been noted. Okay, so I'd like to propose recommendations with, unless anyone else says anything, with the adjustment that Mr. Joel said about Recommendation four to add the um, accountable manager in consultation with the chairman of the council, 151, and the lead member of place. Is there a seconder for that? Um, Councillor Legg. Uh, all those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Chair, just on this issue, can I also just ask um, uh, Craig Droyden to, that we go be very clear on the communication about the reasons for this to the public and, uh, and the level of charges and why they've changed and how what it means per passenger, please. Ensure the communication is good. Thank you. Right. Have you got that on board, Craig? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, item 14, pages 53 to 58, um, infrastructure fees and charges. Good morning, members. Um, as you will have read in the uh, paper, the proposals are on the table for the fees and charges for the infrastructure services for 2018-19. Uh, these are variously either increases as based on the savings plan that members have already agreed. So in some areas, these have gone up by about 10%. Um, in other areas, they've gone up according to uh, at about 3%. Um, some fees and charges have been rounded to whole pounds, which has skewed the percentages a little bit, but just to make them a bit more straightforward. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Councillor Lake. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I call into question the, uh, the percentage increase that is listed here. Um, it, the best example of it is on page 56 uh, whereby if you just read that the percentage has the I'm sorry the the cost has been decreased by a hundred percent that would suggest that it has become free however it has in fact been halved and if you compare this with all of the percentages you can see that they're all actually um, increases have been underestimated and decreases have been overestimated. Um, when this comes to something like commercial waste, it would actually be a greater than 10% increase in costs. Um, I, th I, I, I think from what you're saying is that the calculation has been based upon the proposed, the pr proposed rather, rather than, than rather exactly, yeah. right. which, which means that these tables are entirely misleading um, when you look at the percentages. Subject to that being uh, corrected then, uh, we're gonna have to take this one forward as far as that is concerned. Yeah, I would just, I would just um, make sure any members looking at these figures look at the proposed ones and don't just take the percentage for granted. It's, yeah, it's the pounds, shillings and pence that we're looking at as opposed to the percentages. Councillor Francis. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I would just like to um, draw members' attention to the um, very large increase that you'll see for farm and gar garden waste. Um, I would just, after clarifying this with um, uh, our officer, um, that is... Um, not the intention 
uh, as you are all aware from my report, um, coming before April Council will be the planning up application to deal with green waste on island. Um, this um, proposal here is should that planning application fail for any reason, um, then that is the actual cost to the Council of shipping it away um, and that's what we would be faced with. So um, I just wanted to clarify that in case um, uh, members didn't, uh, didn't well, weren't aware of that. And this only applies to, of course, to commercial waste. Councillor Williams. Um, I just had a query about the cooking oil at the bottom and wondered why it's free. Because it doesn't cost us anything. What, what happens when it, assuming somebody comes down with a lot of cooking oil? What, 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 so process? it gets put into an IBC, which is a bunded container, and it gets shipped off to the mainland for recycling. And we don't get charged anything for that because of it has a value to the people on the other side. So our shipping costs and all of that are covered. So the net cost to the council is zero and therefore we don't pass on because we pass on cost rather than seek to make a profit. Um, we have made it free. Also, since we've made it free, because it has no cost to us, it has increased the amount of cooking oil that we've got through from businesses, which means that businesses aren't pouring oil down the drain, which is blocking up our sewerage. So actually there is a net benefit to the council as a result of that and the community. It improves our recycling rates and all of that for no cost to us whatsoever. Yeah, I think it's worth reiterating that actually the council isn't making any money out of this, it's just passing on costs. It's also really, Good to see that there is trade recycling charges here um, proposed on page 56. Um, can the officer maybe give us an update on proposals around that explanation? Around so the mixed dry recycling, which we've recently started doing um, in a pilot zone up at McFarlane's Downs, um, we're now able to roll that out through to the um, rest of the community, which who have been able to bring it down to site since January. Um, we're now extending that through to commercial customers to bring to site as well. Um, at the moment, we're still awaiting the collection vehicle uh, to introduce the recycling collection on a broader basis to the rest of the community. However, we have sourced a second-hand vehicle for considerably less than the um, maximum amount that we had discussed earlier in the year. And once that arrives on the island, we will be looking to implement phase one of the recycling collection. Um, at the moment, the plan is that that will be include the whole of the country. So anything sort of from Bayview Terrace on one side and nowhere on the other out would be included then in that phase one of the implementation of that. Um, commercial customers in that zone will also be able to take advantage of that through a prepaid SAC scheme in the same way that we do our commercial waste SAC. And once the busy period of the summer is over, we'd be looking to roll that out to businesses in town as well. Yes, all right. um, when will we be likely to see recycling available for our finance? We hope that that will be um, early April. So it, it shouldn't, it, the way in which the waste is taken to the off-island waste sites, the way it's containerized would be exactly the same method as you do with the general waste already. So in theory, there won't be any additional requirements. So it should just be a simple matter of switching it on, uh, fingers crossed. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of the increases here uh, are putting a big burden on businesses. And I'd like to understand the rationale for the, the rises, which are way over inflation and, and frankly, uh, this is um, a very significant rise for businesses on the islands. Could you give me which particular one are you interested in? Uh, well, I mean, several of them are, are way over, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of three percent. But for example, residual waste at nine and a half percent, which was, I think, as Councillor Leg points out, is actually higher. That's over ten percent in reality. Um, vehicle permits, uh, various waste. Uh, so the residual waste is actually a decision of the full council members to increase by 10% at least um, as part of the savings plan. So I was doing as instructed by members on that basis. 
Was that the case? I'm not sure on the specifics of that, to be quite honest. Chairman, just for clarification, that was actually part of the savings plan to make sure that also as well when we're dealing with commercial waste is absolutely on a cost recovery basis. I think actually part of the savings plan was also meant to have a full risk assessment coming to this council, as I highlighted from the minutes. That was resolved last time. <laughs> but Chairman, I think the most important thing is in terms of setting fees and charges, certainly for commercial waste, is that it really has to wash its own face and we really do need to actually cover the full costs of actually collection and disposal because of otherwise obviously council taxpayers are actually subsidizing business and clearly we can't we can't do that just as an example if you have a holiday let which produces one residual waste sack a week a rise of 40 pence per week over 30 weeks of trading is what that would look like to a self-catering business in addition to that residual waste um, sacks, which have gone up from, which uh, we're, I'm proposing go up from £3.80 to £4.20, we are introducing the dried mixed recycling sacks, and they are at a lower cost. So they are £3.70 a sack. So the theory would be that, that um, commercial businesses would be encouraged to divert to dry mixed recycling because that's where they would see their cost saving. In an actual fact, um, it would... In, they could potentially end up with a lower commercial waste bill because they are motivated, therefore, to recycle rather than just shove it all in the um, general recycling. So on the one hand, while some of their waste is going up in price, hopefully about 50% of their waste is going down in price. Yeah, I agree that's a very good principle. I'm pleased to see that in there. I think that the general thrust is that businesses are going to have a, a big burden. And I think, you know, we... <laughs> On the wider point that we, we put council tax up by 6%, we're talking about a lot of fees and charges going up way over inflation. And this is, frankly, a big concern to me. And that's why I feel very uncomfortable with it. And, and I haven't seen the full business case set out to explain why these increases need to happen. Uh, I, I shared uh, Jonathan's concerns, but I think there is a wider constraint, which is the government... Um, which I'm going to blame politics on, basically. We haven't got enough money, and things cost money. So if we want to change it, we're going to have to change the government. So um, it's I'm frustrated as well, but it has to cover its own costs. So, And, and, and Chairman, the fact of life here is that waste management on these islands is going to be proportionally more expensive to deal with than it would be, would be on the mainland. And we know that because... You know, the average rural authority spends, what, £80 per household on waste. We're nearer to, what, £500 per household. So you can see already there's a huge disparity in terms of what we're dealing with. Um, the other thing that I would just ask members to note is that we there is a delegation to the senior manager uh, for infrastructure and planning to change fees and charges mid-year should our costs come down. And should, through procurement or uh, rationalisation or e efficiencies that are found throughout the year, or should we find that the cost to us is less, then there would be no reason why we can't pass those on to the customers um, mid-year. The, the fees and charges that are proposed here gives us the sort of the snapshot in time and gives us some certainty going forward, especially around the savings that members have requested for um, the service areas, but it does not mean that we are entrenched in those for the full period of the financial year. Vice Chair. Thank you, Chairman. I would just ask that we ro be robust in an attempt to keep the cost down for all customers. We are robust in actually identifying what exactly is business or commercial waste, because obviously the definition of a business with regard to business rates is obviously of a certain size, but nevertheless, under the radar, there are lots of other small businesses that effectively produce commercial waste, and they should be charged accordingly, if at all possible. Right. Uh, we have some recommendations to look at. Who's, um, I'll Sorry? propose those recommendations. Right. Uh, one recommendation to look recommendation. at. Put an S in there too much. We've got a proposer. Have we got a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Rogers. Um, 
Recommendation on page 53. Members approve fees and charges for the infrastructure services. All those in favour? Against? That's by majority. Thank you. Right. Um, right. We're still core it, so um, we've got. We need to get the policies in place. It's these. The, 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 right. So. Sorry that the uh, agenda is being messed about an awful lot. However, uh, we've got to get some statutory things that are on, on the deck. Uh, I am now going to move to item 20, which is page 153. Thanks, Chairman. Um, so this report is around the um, revisions to um, the Homeless Reduction Act um, that's coming into force on the 3rd of April. Um, our existing homelessness strategy is somewhat dated. I think it dates back to 2003. Uh, regulation requires us to review it every five years, so um, it's way due for a, a refresh. Um, so what we've done is reviewed the whole policy. Um, we've set out a new homelessness strategy for you to consider, and we've taken into account the new Homelessness Reduction Act, as I say, that comes in force in April. The key points of that act really relate to an earlier, prevent, uh, an earlier intervention by the council. So instead of waiting for 21 de 28 days before somebody is at risk of being made homeless, our role starts at 56 days and it, it continues 56 days beyond them being declared homeless. So we have a, 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 an elongated responsibility. What I would say is that actually in practice, we've been trying to work with our community ahead of those uh, homelessness dates anyway. So it's really a, um, an extension of the work we're already doing, but it includes things like providing an action plan that puts responsibility both on the person that's to, who potentially may be homeless, but also on the council to work with them to make sure we, we put as much prevention measures in place as possible um, to help people find suitable accommodation within that time scale. So um, the, the recommendation is that the homelessness strategy be adopted. Um, it's certainly one that will be a live document, I think, um, and we'll keep refreshing it as we go along. But the extension of the time scale will be until 2023 at this stage, but I would thought we'd be reviewing it once we've start seen the impact of, of it, it on our community. So um, we will review it in the meantime, but uh, the, the recommendation for you today is to um, approve that homelessness strategy which brings us up to date with current legislative requirements. Thank you. Councillor Marcus. Yeah, um, on page 156, paragraph 13, it states that the government thinks that this is going to be an increased workload for the housing department. Does the extra £500 that the government has generously given us cover that extra workload? <laughs> We're not sure yet. Um, there were three cases that we had to deal with in detail last year. I think what we have done is, is, is pre-prepared ourselves. So our staff have been sent away already on training. Obviously, I think we'll earmark that money for, f for further training. What they've also, the staff also done is set up a network of, of other professionals who will be able to give us advice. So some of that will be, will be used for training, but um, we're not sure whether that will cover the costs yet because it depends on demand. Um, but we will work towards providing a good service for our customers. Um, whether that covers it or not is, is for debate. Right, okay. Well, I would just like to note my frustration of central government adding new burdens to local authorities without fully funding them. Duly noted. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's, I propose it's, it's very, very, very much noted, and, we, um, we're all aware of it. Yeah, uh, Councillor Williams, um, I welcome the report and the policy. I think it's an improvement. I think the extension of the days qualifying period is to be welcomed, and anything that supports a person in a what must be a hugely stressful um, time um, should be welcomed by us. I think. Any more comments? No, I'm just going to propose the recommendation. Proposed by Council Marker, seconded by Council Egg. All those in favour of recommendation? That's passed, thank you. Um, item 21. Uh, environmental Health Enforcement Compliance Policy. Nicola? A very quick one for you. Um, basically, at the last meeting, you approved the private sector housing 
recommendations around policy. We're putting the bread and butter in place here. We're making sure we've got policies in place that support the work that we're doing. Um, here we're, we're, we're using the same principles as we did for the private sector housing sector. It, this is co will cover a wider um, uh, areas, including food, um, and we're just supporting businesses, giving advice as the first principles, and then we, when we do have to take action, that's a proportionate approach that's targeted, consistent and transparent and accountable. So it's a, a help and advice service first, and enforcement last principles, which are the very same principles that you approved at your last committee, uh, council meeting. Yeah, I, I welcome this. It's just a tidying up exercise, basically. Uh, are there any comments? If not, I'll ask for a proposal. Um, I would like to propose the recommendation. Councillor Legg, seconder, please. Councillor Marcus, all those in favour? Asked unanimously, thank you. Uh, item 22, committee calendar, page 191. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you all take it as read. Um, please ask me any questions if you have any. Is there any, I would like to revisit the evening meetings. Um, the meetings on average, I did a little maths before I came here, and with this meeting being two and a half hours, um, before this meeting, the average meeting was an hour and three quarters. So it puts off island members at a severe disadvantage, I think, during, correct me if I'm wrong, since there's only one left now as well. Um, but the, those evening meetings, um, there's got to be a better way of doing it than six left. Can I ask Councillor Legg to comment on that, please? Um, I can only speak for myself, uh, but it would be preferable for me if they were in the evenings. Um, one thing I would ask if it was looked into is what the tides are like on those evening meetings, seeing as um, that can be an issue for the other three off-islands. So that is quite a bespoke request, but <laughs> I will. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest we can have a, a, a chat in the round about the whole thing at DPP yeah, as well. I was going to suggest. So um, we agree this in principle with amendments by DPP soon. Are you happy with that? I I, I second that recommendation. So we've got a proposal. I'm second the council. William, did you want to say anything? Um, I just had a query about the December scrutiny meeting, and I just wondered whether um, it might be relevant for budget setting to make that a little bit later, maybe in early January rather than early December. I don't know how budget setting will pan out in terms of time frame. I don't know if scrutiny will have any budget setting type scrutiny to do, but I just wondered whether it would be better to... Um, I, th I think it's quite good to keep the date as proposed because, of course, we're trying to start the budget process much earlier this year. And by December, we should have the opportunity to have scrutiny to look at the, the process and where we are. OK, we've got a proposal. We've got... Uh, yeah, no, I was just about to say, uh, yeah, definitely keep it earlier because that's the whole intention and uh, the, the budget uh, process was later this year. Um, uh, well, it was uh, last bit in December and January. So certainly the plan will be that the, the uh, meeting in December will be to scrutinise what will hopefully be finalised by the code before they go on to in, in the new year to be accepted. So that's, that's quite right from our point of view from the time frame. Thanks, Andy. Uh, right, we've got a proposal and a second uh, with the uh, uh, addition of a D DPP looking at the tides effect on the evening meetings. Uh, all those in favour? Unanimous, thank you very much. Right, now then, um, where are we going now? Uh, item 18. Sorry, what have I missed? Oh, I've missed one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about this, going back and forwards. Item 15 first. <coughs> Pages 59 to 78. Community fund application. Yeah. Um, do you want to, Chief Exec? 
Um, well, take, take the report as read. Uh, members have in front of them a proposal uh, for the community fund, um, including the, the, the um, amount still available to the fund for this year. And it's for members to decide how they wish to allocate and spend the... Any, any debate on that? Relations. Seconded by Council Leg. I can't see what you do. Do you want to make that point or not? Yes. Vice Chair. I just think we ought to ask um, for advice possibly on the comment on page 62 that in the circumstances already described, there would be insufficient funds available in the community fund for 1718 to make the one-off contribution of 500 to the Christmas Lights Fund. So I don't know how members think that we ought to deal with that. Chief Executive. Well, the, if, if the decision is uh, that members are content to make a retrospective um, funding approval for the Christmas Lights, then the current and, and agree the second application, then the budget will be exhausted. But clearly, on the 1st of April, the, the new £3,500 is in the budget for future consideration. So you don't see any problem with agreeing the recommendation? No. no. Okay. No. Okay, we've got a proposal and a second. All those in favour? That's passed, thank you. Now we can move on to item 18. Which is on page 170. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this is a very brief update report as members requested um, at its meeting in January. Um, members uh, requested to commence a review of management and operations. Um, so I'll take the report as read. Um, there are two recommendations in the report. One is for members to approve the objectives of the review as set out in paragraph six. And secondly, a proposal to establish a small panel of members to oversee the um, project and, and to provide uh, democratic input. Comments? Uh, panel, small panel, were we considering how many numbers uh, that I've, might I've be? Discussed, I've discussed this with um, the vice chair, my suggestion from the chair would be the chair, the vice chair plus one other. Um, okay. And I, I, I think. In that case, I'd like to propose lead member for place, Councillor Francis, as it was his instigation to have this review done in the first place. That, that was what I was about to suggest. <laughs> um, are you happy with that suggestion, Robert? Yeah. Any other comments? Council Leg? Um, I would suggest that as we haven't budgeted for for this, that um, the panel attempts to reduce the cost as much as possible. Um, obviously, value for money will always be sought, but um, £25,000 is not something we have lying around right now. Yeah. Just to say that as lead member for finance at the moment, regardless of who is sitting in the seat after May, there are sources of funding for this kind of working review. The LGA is probably a good source to approach in the first instance and hopefully we might get some other funding to carry that out. Mm. Thanks, Rogers. All right. Are there any other comments? Uh, thank you, Chair. Now, I just just uh, to re re reiterate Councillor Legg's um, point and any concerns thereby. Um, you know, hopefully uh, the cost will not be significant, and we will work towards achieving something for a sensible uh, amount. It's probably quite useful <coughs> in terms of update. Um, I I am in discussions with a number of people, including. Um, the improvement arm of the LGA to seek both uh, financial input and um, human resources input. Right, we've got two recommendations and the, the um, panel included on that second one that the panel be the chair, the vice chair and the 
<coughs> lead member for place. Have we got a proposal for that? Proposed by Councillor Marcus, seconded by Councillor Davis. All in favour? Carried. Uh, have I missed anything off the agenda? <laughs> I think I've got everything. There's another part two. We've got part two um, uh, reports, which should take those red. Unless there's anything of burning issues, I don't propose to run those uh, out in public. Uh, other than that, I think we've just about got through it at 10 past 12. Thank you very much indeed.